Less than a month until the California primary and the money is flowing. Why one candidate in the race for San Diego District Attorney has a billionaire's backing. Can homelessness really be solved? One Southern California city says it has a solution for veterans. And life on the White House beat. NPR correspondent Scott Horsley is here with tales of covering the Trump administration. I'm Alison St. John, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Alison St. John, in for Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Michael Smollins, columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune, Amitha Sharma, investigative reporter for KPBS and contributor to the California Dream Project, a statewide public media collaboration, and Scott Horsley, White House correspondent for National Public Radio. When it comes to money in politics, the biggest checks are usually written at the national level. But a massive influx of money to the local district attorney's race threatens to shake up the status quo in San Diego's public safety community. Michael, I think a lot of people assumed that Summer Stefan was the anointed successor to Bonnie Dumanis when she decided to step down. I mean, the supervisors appointed her. Um, seemed like she was the establishment candidate, but now, this massive influx of money from uh, uh, an independent PAC has come in. So tell us, why has billionaire Soros decided to jump into this race? Well, you're, you're correct. She is the establishment candidate. She was appointed, and I think that's part of it. Some people feel that, that you know, I mean, on the local level, things like that have happened before where there's been a vacancy and people have gotten together to appoint uh, somebody. Uh, Summer Stefan is a you know very experienced prosecutor. She's been with the DA's office for almost 30 years. But... This is an interesting thing. You mentioned that, that a person like George Soros, who's a you know, billionaire uh, investor, um, he's had, he finances various foundations that, that are, try to reform governments around the world uh, for you know, pro-democracy projects and you know, trying to reform justice. And more recently, that's what he's trying to do in the United States. And rather go, he's trying to do it nationwide, but rather go to Congress or state legislators, He's really diving in into these local district attorney races. I think there's been like 14 he's been involved with. So what their concern is that they think there's a sort of a have and have not component to the criminal justice system. So that's why they want to, to come in and change that. So just specifically his agenda is to change the criminal justice system. How? Well, primarily by, by getting different kinds of district attorneys. And usually district attorneys are, are out of prosecutorial backgrounds, judges, law enforcement. Uh, the people that he's backed and, and helped elect often are deputy dis or district attorney. I mean, deputy uh, uh, def public defender. Excuse me, like uh, Gen Genevieve Jones Wright, who's challenging Stefan, or uh, civil rights attorneys, and they bring a different perspective. Uh, they think that people are incarcerated too much and probably not for the, the right reasons. They think that that the bail system is skewed towards the the wealthy, the people that have means, and those are the kinds of things they want to change. And they're trying to do it sort of on a nationwide basis, uh, you know, election by election. So there seems to be quite a hue and cry over George Soros's involvement mm -hmm. in this race. But how is that any different from, say, the Democratic National Party contributing mm -hmm. to a PAC, supporting a candidate? Yeah. I mean, it's still someone at a national level or an entity mm -hmm. at a national level contributing money at a local level. It, it is, but he, it, because it's him, it's a little bit different. He, it, 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 the whole process is just it's something people aren't used to, uh, you know, at uh, a very localized race, a granular race, like a DA's race. And the National Democratic Party usually doesn't get involved in DA races or the National Re you know, Republican Party. Um, and just the fact that, that he's got this nationwide agenda and is coming in and may not be as familiar with the situation here. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's sort of why I think it's, it startles some people. And also he makes a good a bogeyman. Uh, he, he's, his investing has uh, caused some controversy. He was fined in France for insider trading. Um, some of his maneuvers have actually aff affected economies of whole countries, mm. or, or people believe that has happened. So he's also a bit of a mystery. So he, like I said, he makes a, a good uh, well, some target. Some people have compared him actually to uh, the Koch brothers on mm -hmm. the Republican side. I don't know, Scott, how accurate do you think that comparison might be? Well, they're, they're comparable in the sense that they're both boogeymen. Uh, you know, the Koch brothers are a target for the left when they want to talk about big money playing on the other side. Soros is a, is a boogeyman for people on the right when they want to complain about 
wealthy lefties pouring money into the system. It's interesting, actually, on criminal justice reform is an area where the Koch brothers and George Soros are on the same side. They both want to see changes in the criminal justice system. And the thing that I'm curious about is why San Diego? I mean, uh, Stefan, her, her sponsor, Bonnie Dumanis, were not the sort of tough on crime prosecutors. Mm -hmm. They're not really Jeff Sessions types, are there? Of all right. the DA's races around the country he could play in, and he's playing in a lot of them, but why San well, Diego? Well, it, it's a good question. A lot of people ask that question. It's not like in Philadelphia, a uh, uh, public, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, civil rights attorney, uh, Larry Krasner, got elected, uh, and that was pretty controversial. They've had a lot of problems from top to bottom uh, in law enforcement and criminal justice there. When, and when I say tough on crime, I'm talking about it, you know, sort of really lock them up, yeah. you know, no mercy. Well, kind of you know, yeah. I think yeah. as you go back, Bonnie Dumas did tout her, her conviction record and stuff yeah. like that. But they've also, San Diego's gotten some credit for certain reforms. We, you know, we've got the, the homeless court, uh, veterans court, a drug court and things like that yeah. to try to get people out of the normal criminal justice system. But I think what is happening that, that, that uh, you know, I haven't talked to a source, but in reading about what he and the people behind him are do wanting to do, they think that there's a systemic problem and so you need to get different people in. While, you know, maybe Dumanis and Summer Stefan aren't, weren't as hardcore as some others, they still, you know, promote that system. And it's very interesting because uh, there's a few other races that, that his pa sources PAC is involved in in California. And one that he's a candidate he's opposing says, wait a minute, I support all these reforms he's talking about. He hasn't done, they haven't done a good job of vetting, so she was a little upset. Mm. Uh, I don't know that's the case here. You know, you do have an establishment candidate and a deputy uh, public defender who really believes in some different kind of changes. So George Soros has, has been successful in other DA's races across mm -hmm. the country. What are his chances in San Diego? Well, um, I think in some of them, this element of surprise was a big thing. I mean, the, the, the sort of MO is that they, they create a pack just, you know, several weeks before the election, like they did here, and dump in a lot of money, and people are just outmatched. Now, I give credit to uh, Summer Stefan and her uh, consultant, Jason Rowe, because uh, I think they saw this coming a year or so ago. They were sounding the alarm. Some people were wondering whether they were crying wolf just to raise money, but they have raised money. And they've actually used this to their advantage. They, they started have. creating some pretty powerful ads, I think, uh, mm -hmm. demonizing Soros. And we actually have a clip mm -hmm. of one of those. Let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at that. San Diego is the safest urban county in America, but that could change. Billionaire activist George Soros is spending over a million dollars to elect a dangerous choice for district attorney. Well, do you think uh, that this could be an effective strategy? It sort of play into people's fears that public safety could be affected by the, this, this other candidate? Well, it always can be. I mean, you know, what everybody tries to do is to define the election early on. And, and uh, I don't think Summer Stefan is th that well known, but obviously she's been the incumbent DA for a while and we see her name out there and she's proposing all sorts of stuff. Uh, Genevieve Jones Wright is really not known, and so while her uh, backers, the Soros campaign, put up a real, you know, biographical spot that's glowing and talks about her as a reformer and her background, yeah, this is like one of the first things out of the box in this recent time from the Stefan campaign, and they, you know, obviously want to paint her as a threat, uh, which is sort of the the mo going on. But just to get back to one point, I was making that that it, it, their chances. We'll see. I think that, that like I said, that, that the Stefan folks have, have prepared pretty well for this. They saw it coming. They convinced people it was going to happen, and they were right. And last I looked, which was about a week ago, they had combined had about $800,000 behind them from her campaign, from the deputy district attorney's pack, uh, the Chamber of Commerce is involved, whether they can match Soros. But uh, that combined with her power of incumbency, I think, will give her certainly a good shot. But they've already okay. doubled Soros, haven't they? Because... Uh, so, Amita, okay. <laughs> we'd love to talk more about this, and this is a race that we will be watching in the KPBS newsroom, but we have to move on here on this fast-moving show. So thank you, Michael. The city of Riverside is one of uh, just 62 communities in the nation that can successfully claim they've ended homelessness for their veteran population. Now, being a military town, this is something San Diego struggles with as it tries to find new ways to deal with this growing problem. Amitha, your story is part of the California Dream series, and it highlights what Riverside has done. From your reporting, what do you think was the secret to their success? Well, they had a lot of money, and that money was federal money in the form of housing vouchers and social services, because we're talking about veterans, and they have access to social services from the VA, and they have these housing vouchers from the VA. So, you know, from the gate, Riverside had a lot to offer. I think what Riverside brought to the table 
in terms of ending veteran homelessness for that city was this dogged commitment to reach out to the city's homeless people um, at the Santa Ana River bottom or scattered throughout the city. So what they did was they sent out these teams of, of outreach people who who went out with um, you know pens and notepads and introduced themselves to the city's veterans, got to know them, knew their names, um, knew their stories, uh, told them that housing was available for them developed a bond, developed trust within them, um, within the vets, and and didn't quit until they had gotten all these people into homes. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just getting the city's homeless veterans on board. It was also about getting the city's landlords on board. They needed to get these these this group of people to commit to renting their apartments to People who had once well, been I mean, homeless. it's interesting because the mayor, I think, um, he, he really reached out to landlords. And in fact, from your reporting, it sounds like the city didn't actually spend that much, only about $300,000 on solving this. Uh, so in a way, he was appealing to the public, the private sector, rather, to come in and help him, right? Right. He said that he went in and met with landlords and pounded on the table and said, it is inexcusable to have veterans living on the streets. Where are you at? How are you going to help? Mm -hmm. And he's, he, his, his energy was, was very genuine, wasn't it? You, you, you spoke to him. And yeah, you know, he had had uh, two family friends uh, from childhood that had descended into homelessness, and he, mm -hmm. he saw the aftermath of that. He also recalled, he shared an anecdote with us um, about his church when he was in the ninth grade would serve dinner to the homeless. And he said one night when, when he was there, um, he grabbed a tray, uh, got some utensils, and turned around to, to hand the tray to someone who was actually a classmate. And as he recalled that, he choked up. It, we paused for about 40 or 50 seconds, and he had a hard time continuing. Um, so he said, you know, he said, I don't call homeless people homeless people. I call them our neighbors without homes. And so he does, he wants to duplicate the success that Riverside experienced with the veterans to the chronically homeless. Michael. Uh, Amitha, you know, you mentioned that, that one of the key things, if not the key thing, was you know, convincing landlords. And I know that was the thrust here in San Diego with Mayor Faulkner. Uh, he had, uh, I guess, getting a thousand homeless vets off the street. And they fell behind a little bit. Uh, and some of that, that was concerned that the, the landlords weren't playing ball, if you will. Um, they started pressuring them more and guarantee, you know, making certain guarantees that these people would, would be good. How is it, is it difficult the rental market is very tight. Um, what kind of pressure can and, and persuasion can a government bring when you have a choice of, of a lot of uh, you, people? Why would you take a homeless? I mean, I think you have to just appeal to emotion. Mm. You have to make the argument, as I believe the Riverside mayor did, that these folks served our country. They defended mm. us. And he basically tried to shame them, to embarrass them into opening what they had to to the veterans. And he is the first person to acknowledge that he will face monumental challenges in convincing landlords to do the same thing for the chronically homeless. People who, you know, maybe are not that sympathetic, people who are ex cons, people who are substance abusers, people who are shooting up in the parking lot. He said, you know, I acknowledge that that's going to be a huge challenge. However, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the same approach that I did with the yeah. landlords um, to our faith based community, to synagogues, to mosques, to churches. But he won't have the same resources, right? I mean, you're he doesn't a lot have the, the same the, resources. The, the vouchers from the VA which won't is, be available. Which is, a, right, exactly. Uh, which is why he said that he's going to appeal to the faith-based community. He wants them to step up in terms of using their network of of congregations to, to offer their apartments, whatever their resources or money, whatever it takes, he said he's appealing to them. Could San Diego tap the same accounts in terms so, of so veterans, that's an interesting veteran question. support? I mean, could, could, could the Riverside experience be replicated here if the city you took advantage of the same resources from the VA and other sources? Well, the, the city has I been mean, taking uh, advantage of, of, they've actually managed to get more than a thousand vets mm -hmm. off the street. Yeah, so it did ultimately reach his goal. So, so yeah. Gordon, Gordon Walker heads the San Diego's, task, San Diego's task force on the homeless. And I asked him about that. I said, look, you know, Riverside had a very small number of homeless vets. 
89. And, and San Diego County, I think, has something like 1,000. I don't know how many the city has. Some, some people say it's around four or 500. But the point is, is that it's different, right? So I asked Gordon Walker, who, who again heads this task force on the homeless, he came from Utah where they've seen tremendous success in terms of getting roofs over homeless people. So he said, yeah, absolutely, you can duplicate this anywhere. We did it in Utah, and, it, and it's all about building trust, getting these, and, and it's all about housing first. Building trust with the homeless people and getting them into these homes. But he said it takes political will. He said, and what he pointed out, and I think this is a pretty important point, he said two of the cities that have the highest number of homeless people in the country um, are in California, the richest state in the country, and these are some of the richest cities. So again, if you've got political will, the money tends to follow. There's also a question of once you have found housing uh, for these folks, then uh, the question is, can they stay um, functioning, self-sustaining, or will they fall back out again of the system? So and, that's and, where the yeah. social services come back in. And, you know, for with the VA, vets at least have a lot of access to these social services, whether that's mental health or substance abuse, um, rehab, um, and job training, and, and helping them find jobs. Okay. So Now, Bill, your veteran actually said he'd been in rehab like eight times before it. What was the charm that made it work this time? Well, so he had been in rehab, yeah, I think around seven times. And then he got a letter from his daughters who lived in Germany. And they said that they wanted to visit him. And mm -hmm. he was living on the streets. And, um, and understand that this is a guy who would get to the liquor store at 6 a.m. and have as many as 50 beers a day and top off that drinking with a couple of hits of vodka. And he didn't stop until he'd pass out. And then he got a bout of alcohol poisoning. So that combined with the letter so from his daughters is what made yes, him decide that I think he's that's got key, to make change. is catching people at the time when they are motivated. Which is to why make you need to change. have those repeated visits. Yes, good. Well, thank you for telling us about that program. Yeah, very inspiring. Managing to get all the veterans off the streets, that is impressive. Now, Scott Horsley has been a White House correspondent since the beginning of President Barack Obama's first term. Our listeners have been hearing him cover complex policy issues for years, somehow making them easy to understand and interesting. Scott, you are in a unique position to tell us. What is the difference between covering the White House under President Barack Obama and President Donald Trump? Well, it's, it's very different. I mean, uh, in many ways, President Trump has positioned himself as the anti-Obama. I mean, just this last week, we saw him pulling the rug out from under the Iran nuclear deal, which was one of the signature foreign policy achievements of his predecessor. He has backtracked on what Obama did with regard to Cuba. Uh, he has reversed economic policies put forward by the Obama administration. But so from it, your perspective, actually covering him, has it changed the way that it's possible to have access to the White House? Yes, uh, it has. I think there's there's you know a more uh, adversarial relationship between the press corps and, the, and this administration than there was with Obama, which is not to say that there was a uh, really harmonious relationship between the press corps and the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. There's always a certain adversarial quality to it. Uh, but President Trump and his his staffers have sort of deliberately set out to undercut the press corps, to delegitimize the press corps. Uh, and, and create an environment where the listening public, the viewing public, the reading public is, is skeptical of any mainstream news account that might be critical of the president. And just this week, he threatened to take away the credentials of uh, what he called the corrupt media. So um, I don't know whether he feels like National Public Radio is part of the, the fake media. He usually seems to mention the more commercial channels. What, what's your yeah. take on his take on well, NPR? Well, for, for better or for worse, we're just not really on the president's radar. Um, so. Uh, that can be a disadvantage when we're trying to gain access. It, we, we, they don't see a lot of need to communicate with NPR. Mm. But on the other hand, we're not uh, usually called out and singled out for attacks like CNN or the New York Times or some of the other news outlets. He, he's just obviously not um, an NPR listener, <laughs> oh, which, no. is, which is also a change from the Obama administration. I mean, you know, President, former President Obama gave, I think, seven or eight interviews to Steve Inskeep, clearly uh, cultivated the NPR audience. Everyone in the White House had the NPR app on their iPad, so we, we were much more of a known quantity in the previous administration. Now, at the last uh, press briefing, um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders addressed this issue of perhaps pulling the credentials. We have a clip of that. Let's watch that. What was the suggestion of taking American journalists' press credentials away 
advocating for a free press in this country. That, that Those two do not go together. The fact that I'm standing here taking questions, the fact that the president took questions from uh, your colleagues just two hours ago demonstrates this White House's commitment uh, to accessibility and to providing information to the American public. At the same time, the press has a responsibility to put out accurate information. To reassure you, Scott, that the president would not act on his threat there? I, I'm not terribly worried about the, the White House delivering on that threat. Uh, and I agree with Sarah Sanders that the news media has a responsibility to provide accurate information. I think all of our colleagues in the press agree with that. We strive to do it. Uh, uh, I wish that the White House felt bound by the same uh, constraints. It's also not true that this administration you know, stands there and takes questions. Uh, it, traditionally, the daily White House briefing ended when the press corps said it ended. It was up to the AP reporter to call a quit on the, on the press briefing. Sarah Sanders routinely walks away from the lectern after 17, 18, 19 minutes when she's done, uh, not when we're done, not when all of our questions have been fielded. Michael. Scott, you mentioned that there's a big difference between the Trump and Obama administrations, but while the Obama administration was uh, more uh, cater not catering, but uh, you know, dealt with NPR and perhaps other outlets the way the Trump administration doesn't, is it a stretch to call them press friendly? I recall some people talking about that. You know, to their surprise, they expected you know the more democratic to be more you know friendly with the press, and in many respects he was. But uh, you know, when it came time, they they really sort of clamped down. Oh yeah, no, I no, I think the Obama administration uh, had held NPR in higher esteem than than. The mm -hmm. Trump administration does, but no, I, th I think both of them uh, had their had their battles with the press, and that's that's normal. Every every administration has their battles with the press. Uh, the Obama administration was was very tough on leaks, especially in the national security arena. They prosecuted half a dozen people uh, for national security leaks. Uh, that was unusual at that time. I think they said it was more than all the previous presidents combined, although we're still talking about half a dozen, so it wasn't an enormous number. But no, they were, they were, no one would, I think, call the Obama administration press friendly or pushovers when it came to the press. Uh, but though, although they did, they did have a different attitude towards NPR in particular. Mm -hmm. And weren't as antagonistic, perhaps. They, they weren't in open warfare right. from the day, uh -huh. from the, from the get-go. Uh, and, and for that matter, they, I think, uh, didn't, didn't, uh, spew misinformation in the same way that this administration mm -hmm. does. You mentioned open warfare. So this administration or some within this administration have called uh, the press the opposition party. Yeah. How, Enemy of the people. Uh, how has that affected the psychology of reporters covering the president or has it? I mean, what is the mood like when you go into those press briefings every day? Well, I think it's antagonistic. I think it's less antagonistic under Sarah Sanders than it was under her, pre her predecessor, Sean Spicer. The, the first Trump administration press secretary. Uh, when Sean Spicer came in, you know, the blood pressure started kind of ratcheting up from the moment he walked into the room. Sarah's more professional, a little bit lower key, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's contested from the get-go. And as I say, she fre frequently just walks off after 20 minutes, which is about a third of the time that a Obama administration press Well, how much last. does NPR actually rely on those press briefings to, to, to cover the White Well, that's, that's a good point. I mean, the press briefings are, are have always been just one of many ways that we gain information, and today they're probably a less valuable source of information than they've ever been before. So uh, what do you do? What other strategies can you use to get to the facts? Well, you can, you can ask questions outside the briefing, either right. members of the White House staff or the various cabinet agencies, or you know, people on the outside who are looking in and, and have some expertise or knowledge about the subject matter. And NPR has increased the number of people covering the White House recently, right? Yeah, just in recent weeks we've added a fourth White House reporter, I'm excited to say. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavy load. They're, they're making a lot of news over there, so it keeps us busy. We, when I started, there were three, but, you know, if you go back to the uh, first George W. Bush term and all of the Clinton administrations and, and going back before that, we only had one White House reporter. So we've, we've made a, a big commitment to covering this administration. Uh, I think our listeners are, are curious about it. Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of... Do you ever worry that perhaps the nation is focused too much on that one uh, area and that we're missing other things that the media should be covering? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, there are 49 seats in the White House press room and they are always filled. Uh, and sadly, across the country, there are state legislatures and city councils and town councils and, and other government entities and other entities that are not getting the same level of scrutiny. And uh, we, we need to be paying at least as much attention to all those other levels of government and other entities as we are to the White House. Mm -hmm. And moreover, within the White House, 
Uh, we pay an awful lot of attention to the sort of palace intrigue, the ups and downs, the infighting, the chaos, the, the personality-driven stories that, were, that surround Donald Trump, the sort of reality show. Uh, we have to be careful not to lose sight of all the policies and uh, the, the real workings of this administration that, that matter to people. You know, I think Amitha and I are two of those that remember the days that you worked in the KPBS newsroom for so many years and, uh, you know, managed to <laughs> keep up to date with what the... Uh, the soaps were on the on the TV at the same time as writing faster and better stories than any of the rest of us. Do you miss San Diego? Now I've got the soap opera right in, right in front of me. <laughs> I do miss San Diego. It's great to be home. Great to Good. be back for a little while. Great. Well, thank you so much, Scott. So that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. Thank you to our guests, Michael Smolens of the San Diego Union Tribune, Amitha Sharma of KPBS News, and Scott Horsley of NPR. A reminder, all of the stories that we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Alison St. John. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.